Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday workshop, where we get together in the middle of the week to learn more about technology. Today, our presentation is going to be talking about free software for editing video recordings, something that uh, many of us uh, do. And you'll find out today, you do not have to be a Hollywood star to be able to do this. Our presenter has discovered three great free, I like free, software programs for edio, editing video recordings. One of which is Microsoft's new ClipChamp, which in, is included inside Windows 11, but you can also go to the store and get it for Windows uh, 10. He also, oh, it's a progressive app for uh, Mac OS's and Linux. KD, or Caden Live is a free and open source app that runs on Windows and Macs and Linux and VideoPad by NCH is a free non-commercial uh, home use. Francis Chow is a volunteer for APCUG and a member of APCUG's OLS online services team, along with the Speakers Bureau. He's been presenting for the uh, presenting for us for the past 13 years. He's currently a member of the Tucson Computer Society, where he maintains an online presence via Zoom since he now lives out in California. He's an avid user of Windows, Mac, and Linux computer. And today, we're going to have him talk to us about video editing. editing. So, Francis, share with us. Okay, let's see. So I get this thing going. Let me know when you see my screen. You see my screen yet? I see your screen. That's a major improvement. Okay. Um, let's start off with the uh, first few slides, then I'll show you a few things on the internet, then I'll get back to the meat of the presentation. Um, this is my email address. I love getting email about my presentations, positive and negative. Okay. Um, this is where all of my presentation slides are stored. It is the website that I started maintaining in 2008. And it doesn't look like I'm going to get rid of the job anytime soon. If you go here, I'll go to it real quick. And you go here. That's my website. And if all the video on the right is causing you too much grief, minimize it. Because most of my slides are going to take up your whole screen. If you click on meeting notes here, you will notice that I have about 700 slides listed, of which three or 400, two or 300 are for today's presentation. I'm obviously not going to show you all of these slides. It's my attempt to document the things I would tell people if I was still teaching a college class. Um, so I'm going to go over real quickly the things I've written about, and then I'm going to then skip over most of it because it doesn't concern today's topic. Um, first of all, this first presentation here, up here, I hope you can see the mouse cursor. I made it as large as I could. Um, it's kind of a summary of everything I'm going to tell you today in about four slides. It doesn't tell you enough to, to usefully do any video editing. Then I, I wanted to tell you, how did I narrow it down to these three or four programs? Well, I started in 2009 and I was volunteering for a computer users group. They wanted things edited. And every time I tried to edit something, my, uh, my computer blew up. So I decided I better learn more about video editing and figure out a way to evaluate the software. So I gathered a whole bunch of stuff of sample media clips, photos, sound clips. And then I created a rigorous evaluation process. And then I started evaluating. I've now evaluated about 80 some odd programs. And every time someone mentions a program to me, I've seen it, and I've been there, I've done that, and, I, and it doesn't work for what I do, okay? So if you want to look at my evaluation process, go and look at it. If you want to tell me how great your software is, go ahead. I've heard it all, okay? 
<laughs> um, then I launch into here some basic information about editing video apps, just some school of hard knocks information, okay? Then last but not least, I go into these two programs I really love. And, and the very end, I talk about a program that I no longer like. It's called VideoPad. I don't like it because I have a wife. I don't need to be nagged every five minutes about anything, okay? So this program nags me in incessantly about paying up. So I guess they are not really free anymore. VideoPad that comes out of Australia. Um, Cliff Champ nags you some of the time, but not much. Caden Live never nags you because it's totally free. They don't want to bother you. They do accept donations, okay? So keep in mind that I've written a lot about both Caden Live and Cliff Champ. And I've written it from the perspective of Windows, Ubuntu Linux, Chrome OS Flex, which a lot of people now own, and Mac OS. And today I'm probably going to concentrate on Windows. You can read the rest of these. If you go to one of these and you click on it, say Cliff Champ for Windows, you'll get a URL right up here at the very top. It's a PDF. I hate PDFs. They're hard to read. And so if you change the, the PDF file ending to .pptx, you can download my PowerPoint. I love PowerPoint. It's very easy to work with and it comes out a lot nicer. And it's, so you can change it to PowerPoint. If you can't get to it, email me and I will be glad to send it to you or send you the correct link. Um, what's I tell you about? Okay, let's get out of this. Oops, I think I just went, no, there it is. Okay. Let's see, is that today's? Oh, let's get up here, okay, free software. Let's start off with a quick five, three minute summary of the entire presentation. Then I'll give you the 10 minute summary. Then I'll give you the uh, half hour summary, okay? Um, also, if I don't get to your question, if you have a comment, shoot, send it to my email. I tried to make this presentation to a group in Canada and everybody sent me something and tell me about, telling me that I was totally wrong about everything. So I'm, I've kind of got my head underneath uh, uh, behind a, a, a barrier now. But if there are some software that you're going to love and it isn't going to be ones I love, okay? That's, that's life. And I've tried your software. And these, these are the only ones that work for me. Um, and the things I do. Um, okay. If you're running Windows, ClipChamp and Kden Live are the two best and the only ones that meet all of my criteria. I have got about 12, a dozen criteria I use for determining whether or not a piece of software will edit video successfully for me, okay? ClipChamp just came out about a year and a half ago. Microsoft, in their wisdom, decided that they weren't going to create their own. So they purchased a company in Australia that does a great job of editing video. Um, Caden Life is a total freebie it does just about everything that you would ever want with video. So if you ever want to pay for it, it's good for the economy, but Caden Life is your freebie, okay? And if you're running uh, iMovie, if you're running a Mac, I don't care how many other pieces of software are available for a Mac, the bundled iMovie, I've been using it since 2008 and 7, is the best. Um, so you can't beat that. And Caden Life is available if you want a few more bells and whistles. Cliff Champ also runs in the Mac, but most Mac people don't want to run a piece of Mac Microsoft software inside their Macs. It's just a matter of uh, their attitude probably. And then if you're in Linux, Caden Life and Cliff Champ are pretty darn good, okay? And ClipChamp will only run in Linux inside the Chrome or Google browsers, which doesn't, isn't a showstopper. It's just a little slower and it doesn't let you save as much, okay? All the saving is done inside the cache of the browser. Um, then I also have I've written a separate presentation, as you saw earlier, about how to run ClipChamp inside um, 
Chrome OS. But I, unless you're running a Chrome OS computer, you won't be too excited about it. Now, what else I want to show you? Let's go into some details. Um, let's go here. Where is it? Okay, first of all, I'm going to show you my pre my criteria for de determining what's a good video editing software. Um, let's see where I put it. Right here, right? Evaluation. Okay, I'm going to go through it over this extremely fast. You can look at it. You can disagree with me like a lot of the people in the last group, but this is what I decide, I, I use for testing a piece of video uh, editing software. Okay, here's my report card. I used to teach school. Uh, can it edit? This is the killer. Can it edit two hour and one hour Zoom MP4 videos? Zoom has tremendously compressed recordings. Very few keyframes, lots of delta frames. Keyframe, delta, delta, delta. Keyframe, delta, delta, delta. That's the way video is stored. And if you throw most software, most of these Zoom recordings into most software, it'll either lock up or tell you it can't be done. Then Microsoft has M WMV files, Mac has a lot of MOV files when you record video using an iPad or a Mac. Can this software import your photos into a timeline? A lot of software can. The timeline lets you adjust this and cut and, and, and modify the video, okay? Can you split the timeline? Some software cannot. Can you separate the audio part of a video from, from the video part in the timeline. Can you boost the audio level of a timeline segment of video by at least 100%? I need to put a space there. If you cannot, most of the Zoom recordings come out too soft and you, if you can't kick it up at least by 200%, 1 to 200%, they make lousy, uh, distorted, scratchy sounding YouTubes, okay? Can you adjust the brightness and contrast of a video? Very important. Uh, and can you perform a rectangular crop on the video so that when someone screws up the recording, you can still show the part that you want to show and not put make the recording a small part of the, uh, the what's actually important, a small part of the recording. Okay, those are the things. And most, 99% of the software I have tried fails this, this acid test, okay? Now, what else can I tell you about? Let's go here, let's go here again. Um, basics, let's talk about basics. Okay. Make it bigger. Okay, that's the group I, I just presented to. I got beat up. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna t tell you some of the things that I already probably already rattled off to you. Um, just for last, I'm going to also jump into my Mac to show you how something, something I really like doing. Uh, there. Okay, that's my Mac. Hope you can see it. If you have a real slow computer, you'll see it in about 10 seconds. Um, this is iMovie. It's simple. It works. It can chew on anybody's video and insert keyframes and other things other videos can't do. This is a presentation I made a recording of by Michael Young about um, electric vehicles. Very great pre presentation. And I went and edited it at before and uh, right afterwards. You don't, when I pr provide a video for somebody, they don't want to see the start where somebody's struggling to get their, their screens shared and the video right and the audio right. You don't want to see the end when somebody's making s comments that have nothing to do with the video. That happens on almost all videos, okay? <laughs> so anyhow, this is great. I'm not gonna show it to you. You have to pay the Apple tax to get it. What's the Apple tax? It's what you, the extra you have to pay to get an Apple computer compared to a Windows computer or a Linux computer, okay? That's how it looks. That's very typical. Up here is what they call the, um, uh, what do you call it? Media tray, right? 
down here is the timeline over here is the viewing so you can yeah, zoom in and then if you play around with this slider here you zoom in and out for making fine cuts in in to get rid of noise and dogs snoring and that sort of thing okay that's the end of what i'm going to show you on the mac i've got a whole presentation about that also but i've never given it because i don't the mac groups don't generally use external presentations okay so that's that one um okay um okay so back in 2009 all i could find that worked for free obviously there's lots of non-free ones like adobe premiere and final cut pro by apple and done tons of other really great pieces of software but they were out of my price range which i had just retired okay so i've always stuck with the free ones um okay First thing I want to tell you is if you're importing uh, using a free piece of software, media clips, photos, short videos, um, sound, short sound bites, things like that into a video project, the well, once you import it, it's going to be touchy. If you then move it away from where you've just imported it, you're going to cause problems with the project, okay? That's not true for iMovie. That's not true for the paid ones. But for free ones, they're touchy. So make a folder inside documents or inside videos in your computer and call it the name of the video editing program. Do not remove. And in there, make subfolders, year, month, day, title of project. You'll be glad you did. And don't touch it. Don't remove this folder until you're finally done with the project, 100% done, okay? Um, okay, this is my naughty list. I just started it because people started telling me how great various pieces of software were, so I started my naughty list, okay? I've got actually, I'm not gonna show you, about 60 programs that I have failed my test, okay? Now, what else I wanna show you about? Okay, let's go here. Drive requirements, okay. Drive requirements. Okay, I don't know if I have it all done correctly, but first question comes to mind for most people is, I don't think I can edit video. I'm gonna run out of space on my hard drive, on my SSD. That's partly because of the size of SSDs. In the good old days, when you bought a computer, they gave you one to four terabytes of a spinning hard drive, right? Now what do they give you? I've seen computers with it allows you 300 or 200 um, gigabyte SSD as their main hard drive. That, that's a killer for video editing, okay? So you have to get pretty smart at dealing with it. One thing good about it is Microsoft has written, what's happening? Okay, ClipChamp. ClipChamp, in, when you import it as a like a Windows app, only takes up a 14 meg. So they made it small, knowing that they're gonna screw up a lot of people's computers, but that doesn't stop you from needing all that space to store in videos or in documents, the source documents. Then that can, can easily be a killer. So you have to get smart about how to store things if you have a small SSD in your computer. Okay, I think that's about it. 14, okay. Caden Life takes up 98 megabytes. Um, unless you put in the uh, portable version, which takes up 492 megabytes. So you got two versions of it. And I'll go into that later. See, uh, what else I tell you about? Okay, so keep in mind that the software itself won't take up anywhere near as much space as your projects. So you have to plan ahead and try to saw store your media files on a larger hard drive, but one that you can still get to and one that you don't want to move until you're done with the project 100%. Okay. What else I tell you about? Okay. Um, elements. Okay. Now, Let's start off with your options. I think I already went over some of that. 
there's only three I, I currently like, and of which most people can only run two, right? So knowing that, I'm going to dive into ClipChamp because it's a freebie, okay? Um, I'm going to find it over here. ClipChamp is up here under, um, where did it go? There it is. Okay. ClipChamp is, I've, I've broken up ClipChamp into three, three uh, presentations. I'm only going to give you the Windows one today. You're welcome to the other ones. This is more detail than I can probably tell you. So I'm going to jump over a lot of it much faster than most of you can remember. Okay. But far faster than I can remember. That's why I wrote it all down. Okay. Cliff Champ. Okay. About a year ago, I noticed a new piece of software in my computer called Microsoft Cliff Champ. I couldn't figure out what it's for, so I ignored it. Microsoft is now shoving it into all Windows 11 computers as part of updates, Windows updates, and you don't have a choice. You can then remove it, but they consider it a critical part of Windows 11. For Windows 11, for Windows 10, you can add it from the, either the Microsoft Store or from inside Photos when you click on Video Projects, it lets you install Microsoft ClipChamp. Okay. Okay. ClipChamp comes in two formats, a uniform Windows platform app and a progressive web app. It doesn't come in a portable app. Um, so I'm going to go over real quickly what these two are. What is a uniform Windows platform app? To show you that, believe it or not, I have to jump into Linux, which is a little crazy, but Microsoft won't let you see one from inside Windows. So I'm going to go and jump into Windows, uh, Linux. I'm going to attach my Windows drive, hard drive from my Windows computer to this Linux computer, Linux, uh, Unix, uh, Ubuntu. Okay. I'm going to run files, which is actually called Nautilus. I'm going to go, go to other locations. And there's my Windows computer hard drive. And there's my Linux computer's hard drive. I'm going to double click on it. Now I'm looking and using Linux to fish around in a Windows computer. And Microsoft does not really like you doing that. They get mad at you when you do it. If you go to program files, which is where most of your programs are, the programs that are there, including uh, Ava Demux, which got beat up over. Um, if you go to a folder called Windows Apps, that's where Microsoft is hiding all of your universal Windows platform apps to make, keep them away from malware and things. So this is something you can't do in Windows. Double click on it. And what do you have in there? A bunch of folders. One of which is Microsoft Office, which is down here. And a bunch of other uh, 365. There's all kinds of good stuff in here. Wallet. All these things are hidden from view of a Windows user. If you go to ClipChamp, you notice that they've split it up over five different folders. If you pick the third folder, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Let's try again. If you go to the second folder, if you go down to ClipChamp, you'll find a, fo a folder called ClipChamp.exe. No, that's not right either. It's in there somewhere, I promise you. Um, <laughs> let's see, where did they put it? That one? No. Anyhow, they hide it. They even make multiple folders to, to make to confuse the malware. Okay. Anyhow, if you go into here, I don't see it today. There it is. Okay. Subfolder of loopchamp.exe is what you're used to seeing for an executable file. You can't get to it in a Windows computer. When you double click on Clip, Microsoft ClipChamp in a Windows computer, in usually in the start menu or from a shortcut you've created, it tells the registry to start this file right here. And registry knows to get it started. So I'll probably end up doing that to show you. Okay, so that's that one. Now, that's the uniform Windows platform version of ClipChamp. There's also a progressive web app version. 
ClipChamp runs either way, and both methods are available once you install ClipChamp. If you install ClipChamp, you get this version, this one here, the Uniform Windows Platform app. If you just have a copy of Google Chrome or Microsoft's Edge browser, you can run this a great thing from any computer in the world. So Microsoft is giving you a freebie if you're inside a Linux computer and you want a real efficient, small program to edit video, okay? Now, I'm not gonna, since this presentation is about free software, I'm not gonna talk about the three cost levels. ClipChamp comes in three cost levels. I'm gonna make it real quick. A free level, which you're gonna to want to run, a Microsoft 365 level, which means it's bundled as part of your yearly fee for Microsoft 365, an essentials level, which adds all kinds of doohickeys to it, all kinds of fancy transitions and for and all kinds of effects to it for $11.99 per month. I do not recommend the third one. I think it's way overpriced when you could be doing most of that for free with the other piece of software, which is Kden Live. Okay, so I'm going to get out of there. And I'm going to, oops, I forgot to make it bigger. Yeah, when you first log into it using a web browser, uh, you see this friendly screen here. And it says create a new video. And if you go down a bit, it shows you all the videos you've already created. I wish I probably don't, in this particular case, I probably don't have it. I don't have any, so I'll have to show it to you live, I guess. Um, this is another little story, which I'm not going to have time to tell you about. There's four kinds of apps inside of Windows 11 or 10 computer. Conventional, universal window, universal Windows platform apps, portable apps, and progressive web apps. The only one I haven't really gone over is progressive web apps. That's a, a yeah, you get into them from a browser, web browser. The reason they're progressive is because they make use of the cache in the browser to store your settings, sometimes your files, and sometimes your preferences. So they use the cache in that particular browser. So each browser you start will let you start, will run it with a different set of program uh, projects. Okay, now, what's that there? Okay, two ways to run uh, Windows um, Universal, two ways to run ClipChamp, okay? And I'll show you both ways. If you're in a win, any computer, it isn't Windows based like Chrome or Mac, you have to use the progressive web app. That's the only way Microsoft will let you run it inside a web browser. And you have to run it either inside Microsoft Edge or, or a Google Chrome browser. So those are your choices. It is rumored that eventually they'll kill off the, the Google Chrome version. That version was a, is a holdover from the company that originally developed this software in Australia. And what else I tell you about? Okay, uh, ClipChamp. Okay, ClipChamp has this nice icon when you want to run it from inside the start menu. Okay, uh, the one thing funny about ClipChamp, and I don't know why, but it's certainly not my choice, you have to have an internet connection to run it. Microsoft needs to track you in order to run ClipChamp, okay? For better or worse. And that is a bit of concern for some people, okay? I, I have nothing to hide anymore, uh, so I don't care. But if you don't want Microsoft to track you, don't run ClipChamp, run Kden Life. Kden live instead. It doesn't track you at all. It doesn't require an internet connection. Okay. Um, okay, I've already gone through a lot of this because I've, if you're in the start menu and you've installed ClipChamp into your Windows computer, if you click on video editor and you're in a Windows 10 computer, it gives you, when you click on photo projects, you get this funny screen. If you click on get clip champ, it runs you into the store and helps you um, install clip champ, okay? 
Now, if you try to install Run Clipchamp in an unsupported browser, and that includes a lot of good ones like um, uh, Firefox and Chrome and much other things, it gives you this error. That's the error, error message message. So you so you have to gradually install, eventually install the browser that they're willing to run in. Okay. Um, it also forces you, once you run it for the first time, to log into your Microsoft account. That I don't personally see any reason for doing so, other than the fact that I do need to sell some information about you and what you're doing with your computer to an advertiser. Okay. I don't really mind, but some people are real upset over, over that. And th this is unlike Windows, where you have, in Windows 10 and 11, you can either make a local account or you can log into Microsoft. So you can decide whether or not, whether or not you want them to track you. Clipchamp doesn't give you that choice. Okay. Um, okay, so I've already gone over this. So we're gonna get out of here and move on to the nuts and bolts of Clipchamp. Uh, let's go into there. Clipchamp for Windows, right? All right, I'm gonna make it bigger. Okay, this is probably more detail than I can cover today. It tells you how to do every major function of editing a video inside Windows, inside Clipchamp, either the progressive web app version or the universal Windows platform version. They both work the same. And they both use storage of files for media on your hard drive. So unlike the better software like iMovie, Clipchamp never stores in its pro program files, project files, any of your media files. You have to already have them stored somewhere on your hard drive. And if you move them from that spot afterwards, after you make the project, you cause it a lot of, a lot of grief, okay? Okay, three cost level. Okay, we went through that before. We went through that, we saw it. Upgrade, okay. If you see something like that, don't click on it. They want money, okay? <laughs> uh, and if you're running the free version of Clipchamp on your computer, like in a Windows computer, in a Microsoft a Linux computer, or in a Mac, you'll see free and essentials as your plans, okay? If you already have 365 installed into your Mac or into Windows, it shows you the 365 version and the essentials version, okay? App types, okay. I've already gone through that. And a lot is redundant because I know it by heart. And I've, when I'm making these presentations as separate presentations, I've got to go through all of the details for people. Okay. Okay. Just for last, I'm going to show you Cliff Champ Live. Okay. How's that? Um, before I get involved in more details. If I start up a web browser, say Microsoft Edge, very popular now, I write clipchamp.com, and there it is. Then it challenges me to log in. If I've logged in before, it tells you which one do you want to log into, or it just logs you in. And then it lets you, it looks like it's doing some updating of some kind. Boy, I hope this isn't going to go on forever. Okay. It looks like it's having problems for me. Okay. I don't know what I did to anger the Microsoft gods. Anyhow, to make a short, long story short, your projects are at the bottom of the screen and your uh, you can start a new project at the top of the screen. Okay. Something went wrong. We don't like what you've just done. I don't remember doing anything to them. So anyhow, that's the progressive web app version of Clipchamp. It doesn't do that when I'm not 5,000 things open. Then if you go to the start menu and you go to all apps and you look for Microsoft Clipchamp, which is going to be down here, if I can get lower, lower down, like they, can, they, can, they don't look for Clipchamp. They won't, they won't find it. And you click on it and you, hopefully it'll let me in and it won't give me all this trouble like the other one just did. Okay. Now, this is how 
it's real friendly. It says, uh, here's some templates you can use. Here's some videos you created. And obviously, I've used one of Microsoft's smallest 30-second videos, so I don't have to spend hours trying to show it to you, right? So if I start a new project, create a new project, it gives me a space to, it gives me a, some advice. Then you can drag your media files, your video clips, your sound bites, and your photos into this section over here. Most of us just call it the media tray. Once you do that, you can drag it from the media tray into the um, into the timeline, which is down here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go back into projects if I can. That's this way, I believe. Or I can just drag a new one. I don't know. I thought. I could get back into it, back to home, okay. I'm gonna go down and look at one of my, my projects, okay? A simple project, this one. It says locate asset. Okay, it claims to me I'd, I moved the asset. That's not something you wanna do. But I'm gonna locate it, locate folder, go, uh, go locate that and go to, I must have moved it, huh? Clip champ, okay, corral do not remove. Locate asset, open. Now it's happy with me, finally. Okay. You notice that I already dragged it during the yesterday into the timeline down here. Okay. And to make a long story short, how do you crop this video? You just drag those corners or these edges to make a smaller video, part of the video, the, the part that you're actually displaying to the, to the end user, right? So how do you... Zoom in and out of the timeline. You click on the plus and you zoom in. You click on this, full, fill up the timeline and you go minus, they make it smaller. This going in and out lets you edit out things like dogs snoring and things like uh, people coughing and people like wives uh, yelling profanities at you, okay? You can in, zoom in and out to, to extract out by cutting multiple, doing multiple cuts using this this, this cutting uh, button, which is the scissors. You can find a spot, you click, and you, you can split the video into two sections. If you get there and you, and you had a regular cursor, click on it and you just chop the video into two sections. You can move, move it and jam another video or a, a, a title. Uh, bunch of title screens into the, the middle of the video. See? So that's in a sh short, in a quick demo how it works. And it works a lot better when I don't have so much stuff open. It doesn't complain like it did when I was running the web, progressive web version of it. Okay? Uh, let's see what else I can do. Okay. What else can I show you about? All right. Um... I already showed you this, I already showed you that. All right, more information. Starting it. Okay, start it. Okay, if you want to make a shortcut on your desktop, type, go right click on the start button with the right mouse button, click on this run, type in shell apps folder, shell colon apps folder. Then you find it, right click on it, make, uh, left click on it, create shortcut. Okay, I'm not going to go through that because that's part of another presentation. I'm trying to make sure I get plenty of other presentations to do for people. Okay, um, importing media files. Okay, I already told you that you have to make a folder in documents and call it something. And the best thing to call it is, clip, in this case, clip chat corral do not remove. Then make a subfolder after, named after the project so that you know which ones to delete when you finally remove a project. Okay, so do all that. Drag files into it uh, and what else do you do okay you start up clipchamp okay and oh boy I better make it bigger start up clipchamp and you this is a presentation that Mark Schulman made it was excellent preserving digital photos I recorded it and create a new video drag and drop the media files into the media tray 
not hard, right? Draw, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work until you drag into this little gray area, okay? And you do it, you drag from wildlife Delphi MV into the media tray, like I, I'm showing you right here. And then you drag and drop from the media tray into your timeline. That's not hard, is it? All right. Once you have it in the, and you click on it in the timeline, you, you have what I just showed you, right? Okay. If you right click on it and you click on um, audio, you can adjust the overall audio of the entire clip. But if you want to just get rid of a, a lawnmower from a, the gardeners that just showed up at the house here, um, you have to split out that audio and then click on it and then delete it. Okay. So, so the, that's cutting is the key to removing small parts. And sometimes you want to just cut out the audio part of the video and leave the, the video part. So there's a lot of fun things you can do. I've been doing it for since 2009. See? And then use plus and minus buttons to zoom in and out of the timeline. You, If you have the whole presentation in that amount of space, cutting out the sound of a firecracker from a neighbor is going to be very hard. If you start clicking on plus, you can get that firecracker down to a single bump or two in the audio and then cut it out. That's what I've been doing since 2009 for people. They think I'm a real genius. Um, if you want to split the time sign somewhere, move the playhead to it, then click on the scissors. Okay, the playhead is this vertical bar. You don't want us to try to split the timeline until you know exactly where you want to split it. Okay, what else I'll tell you about? Adjust the audio of a single time. I think I've gone over it already. <laughs> to avoid, um, okay, additional information. Okay. So that's that, okay? I think I'm in the wrong slide show. Let me try another one. All right, I went to details. Hmm, oh, I could have swore I had more details about editing video. I must have, let's see. Okay. Well, I guess I, I didn't write as much as I thought about it. Anyhow, that's Clip Champ. Okay. Now let's go into Caden Life. Um, let's go there. I thought I wrote more about it. Let's go to Caden Life. Let's start it on. Let's start it up on it. I only wrote the Win Windows version of this one. But once you get it started in Linux or or Mac or a Chromebook, it's the same. Okay, once you get the com software going. Um, let's go here, let's go bigger. Uh, meeting notes. Okay. Caden Life Summary is an acronym for KDE Nonlinear Video Editor. KDE is a group of developers that write a lot of software. Most of the time, they don't stoop down to writing for Mac and for Windows, but they made an exception in this case because there was so much demand for it. Uh, the nonlinear means that you can jam clips and you can move clips around and you're not stuck with a linear situation where you have to add one tape after another, like in the old days when people had the editing with two uh, video recorders. And, and rolls of tape. And video editor stands for as, as part of the name of it. It was developed by a gentleman in New in England called Jason Wood in 2002. He got sick of doing it. A bunch of other people took, took it off, took the code from him and expanded it further. And the developers are located everywhere. I don't, it gets me a little nervous when I see developers located in Russia, China, and sometimes in Pakistan but I don't find any that are in those locations, okay? It is totally free. There is one version. There's no paid version. They gladly accept donations. 
but they do not bug you ever. Uh, report card. Obviously, it matches my with flying colors, my report card, right? They've provided a ton of training. Go here and get trained. Real nice, easy to easy to read training written for people like me who don't see that good anymore. If you don't find it, you won't find it in Windows Microsoft Store. If they don't want to put in anything about the competitors. So you have to download the darn thing. That's called sideloading. And then click on, and then double click on it to install it. Okay. Um, comes in two versions, I told you. A standalone version and an installable version. What? Why do I like the standalone version? The installable version uses the Windows registry. When you do something in the Windows registry, just like the gentleman in Australia just said, they track it and they sell that information. Not about you, but generally about who's using it. And also they use it as an excuse to bug you about installing ClipChamp, okay? So that's why I like the standalone version, even though it's 400 meg. The installed version, it's a little, it's a lot smaller at 14, at 90 meg, 90 some odd meg. But that, and that's why a lot of Windows users end up using it. Okay, that's how I tell you about. Okay, 492 meg, boy, that's a monster. 98 megs, that's a little more doable. Now, I don't care. I have huge gamer machines with four gig, four terabyte uh, SSDs. A lot of people find 492 megs a bit hard to stomach. Okay, yeah, I just heard a sonic boom. Um, so what else did I tell you about? It looks like this right, when you install it. If you, this is this one here, cadenlive.exe is the installable version, okay? So once you get it installed and you go down into your start menu, you'll find it. First, at the very top of the start menu, because that's where Windows put new stuff. See up over there? And then later on down there in the case. And like I told you before, if you use shell colon apps folder, you can make yourself a, sh a shortcut for it. Okay. And I like to put it in for both private and public networks. If you spend a lot of time in dangerous places, don't allow Caden Life to run in a public network. As long as the stuff already covered, okay. Um, oh, I'm trying to get in here. Okay, dragging data files, media files to the timeline. Well, it gets kind of old, right? I've shown you it to you in ClipChamp. You drop it into the sequences area. They call it the sequences area, and then you drop it into the timeline. The trick to this one is drop it into the V1 timeline. V1. Don't drop in a V2. In fact, most people want to delete the V2 until they need a second video timeline. And most people want to delete the second audio timeline just to make, because this thing takes up a lot of room on your monitor, okay? So I had to go ahead and, in this case, since I have such a big monitor, I didn't do that. And then there's a time remapping slider near the lower right-hand corner of the Caden Life window. See where it says time remap? I bet you can't see it. Oops, now you can't see it also. <laughs> can't win, can't we? You click on it, it lets you slide the slider to decide how much to zoom in to the timeline. If I'm trying to get rid of a sonic boom like the one I just heard, I'm going to have to slide it way in to look for the mount, double mountain okay, in the audio. Okay, and one thing I do like about Caden Life is it automatically separates the video and audio. I don't have to right click on it to separate the two into two separate timelines. One thing I don't like about it is if you drag in a second video, it puts it into V1 on the top and A V2 on the top and A2 on the bottom. They're separated. You have to remember that they're both related because they're not running next to each other like in most software. Okay. Hmm. 
What else can I tell you about? Okay. If you cl right click on it, on any of them, and you click on delete track, kick out the ones you don't need. See, for most people, it's V2 and A2. Okay. What else can I tell you about? Um, okay. Splitting the timeline. I just think I just went over that, didn't I? <laughs> Okay, I guess I keep getting ahead of myself because I have all this stuff memorized. Okay, let's go through it. Just the audio level of a segment of the timeline. Okay, first of all, you use scissors to chop, cut, cut and separate the segment that you has the offending noise. Okay, in my case, it's a firecracker that just went off. You probably didn't hear it because I have a directional mic. Once you get it split out, Click on the audio button near the upper right corner and either, well, if you want to adjust the level, if you want to just get it out, just right click on that chunk of the timeline and say delete, right? Or hit the delete button. In this, in most cases, a lot of cases, I want to make it softer or louder, like somebody's too soft, some people mumble like I do, and some people blare. So I want to adjust it. And over here, it isn't too clear, but um, the, it's trying to show you on the far right, the main audio channel. On the far left, the first audio channel. So the main audio channel is the uh, entire segment. And the input is whatever audio you, uh, you have in this case. Um, you have to adjust, if you want to make things louder or softer, you have to adjust the leftmost slider up a little bit at a time and the right to reduce the amount of distortion. Okay, so you have to adjust both the input and the output audio at the same time to end up with a clean sounding increase to your audio. Okay. So what else did I tell you about? Actually, I think it's shown. I it just is hidden up here. What which channel it is by my on my screen at least. Once you're done, click on back either on the escape key or on the editing key to to get rid of the editing on the audio. I got a Liz. Never mind. I'm gonna have to edit that. That's all I have to edit that out. I'm trying to get her to answer the phone. I mean the doorbell. She's in the back playing with the yard. Okay. She just yelled, coming and coming and coming. All right. What else can I tell you about? Make a segment of timeline lighter or dark darker. Okay. You for you do the same thing again. You split out the section you want and um, go to either brightness or contrast and adjust it. Darker by well, playing with a slider, which is down here, see? So you can do a lot of that. What else can I tell you about? Contrast is there. Well, once you get into it, it gives you this up at the very top and you can adjust it left and right, okay? Um, all right, what else can I tell you about? Crop a section of the timeline. All right, this is interesting. You go to editing and then click on effects. Editing just kind of zeroes out whatever you're doing. Go to effects, two kinds of crop. Crop by padding on the left and crop by crop scan, scale and tilt. Padding makes the whole thing shrink in size, the entire video and makes that new, which you're, the new selection section, your entire video. Cropping by scaling and tilting lets you pull on the corners or on the edges. And then it tries to keep whatever aspect ratio it, you, you, you need so that your video looks good. Uh, the end result, okay? Okay, well, okay. Um, I think, let's see, I think at the end of what I was going to do, I was going to leave you some uh, place, a place for questions and comments, so, some room.
So I, I, I obviously have a lot more I could tell you and show you, but I think we need to, I need to stop sharing and let's let you guys say something. What do you think? Well, I love Caden Live because it's open source and free. <laughs> I thought that would just make you grin really big. Okay, we are open for, um, oh, Francis, thank you so much. Love the yes. presentation. And um, everybody will get a copy of your slides. So you'll be able to uh, watch the video again and or use his bullet points that explain what the, you know, the how-to slides behind them actually do. So we are on for questions and don't forget you uh, Google people, if you're still here, uh, revisit those questions because Rob has hung around. Thomas, you are on, your turn. Uh, hi, Francis. Have you experimented with uh, DaVinci Resolve? Yes, I have. It, it didn't uh, meet all of my requirements, but it is, a lot of people love it. Uh, I, that's the first question I generally get uh, in most of these presentations. It isn't quite smart enough to deal with these super compressed one and two hour videos from Zoom. Other than that, I'm quite happy with it. And it's lacking a couple of other features that are in my list. But yes, uh, there are many users of it. That's for, believe it or not, that was the first question asked of me when I made this presentation last time. So there are a lot of people using it. And if you're not dealing with these obscenely compressed videos from a Zoom recording, it's fine. Pierre, yeah. one other thing. Uh, Oops, just... sorry, Tom, carry on. Okay, last thing. Uh, does does what you're talking about apply to videos made by somebody using their camera? Absolutely. Uh, my wife makes a lot of videos with her cell phone and her camera and you just download it into your media tray and away you go as a matter of fact 90 percent of the videos that people edit that i've seen uh, when they want to show me a video is normally of a kid screaming in a, in a playground or a dog barking in a dog park and there are real short ones from uh, cell phone cameras and from v uh, video cams so yes it works just fine it cleans it up and uh, video cams don't tend to compress like Zoom does. So they're easy to use. So people just get, uh, suck, suck them into a cell phone and edit away. There isn't the kind of problems that I've been having with the Zoom and Adobe, performerly Adobe Connect videos. But yes, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I uh, thank you, Francis, for that presentation. But I just have two comments for the Gmail uh, folks. Um, there was a comment that said that uh, there was no way to, or it known, not known uh, to Bob, to uh, synchronize contacts between Outlook and Gmail. It's a real shame on a Microsoft part that in 2023, you still cannot do that uh, natively. Uh, but thank goodness for the past 10 plus years, uh, I've, I've installed something called Go Contact Sync Mod uh, on my sister's computer so she can uh, uh, synchronize her contacts between Gmail and Outlook. So it's called Go Contact Sync Mod, and it's available from uh, PDF Forge. Um, and then the second comment that I wanted to, to clarify, somebody mentioned that POP3 cannot be encrypted. That is incorrect. POP3 can be encrypted. You have to use the non-standard, or I, I should say, the non-default ports. Uh, by default, POP3 uses port 110 for receiving and 25 for sending. But if you use 995 for receiving and 587 for sending, then your connection will be encrypted. Bert Trout. Yes, there, there is an option in uh, for Zoom recordings 
to make the file more amenable to other editors. Um, I found that that's a necessity if I want to take and process a Zoom video file. And I'm wondering if that would not solve Francis's problems with, uh, with handling uh, video from Zoom. Well, I'll have to go try it. <laughs> I've done everything default. And so as most people that record from Zoom. There also is from Zoom, you can record up on the cloud. And sometimes that that gives you a better recording than down on your computer. I don't know why. But uh, there's a lot of things I haven't tried. If you do that, you are, li <clears throat> you are limited to the amount of space you have in the cloud. And it's roughly an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And it's, it's tied, tied to your limits on your account. If you're recording locally, then you have no storage limit. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll try it. I'm always willing to try something new. They, they keep adding features into Zoom. I haven't caught up with all the latest. You'll, you'll probably notice that they update Zoom almost once or twice a week. So I haven't caught on to all the different features. One feature I really like about Zoom is the ability to take over control of somebody's computer. And uh, I've got a demonstration on that too. It seems to do a better job than Microsoft's way of doing it. Oh, no. Gary, Odie, your hand is gone. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, after you've done your all your vid video editing in Caden Live, and you want to export the final product, can you choose other uh, frames per second, like going from 30 to 60? And can you choose a higher bit rate if you want to, or a lower bit rate to export it as an MP4? I can't remember. Let me try, let me try one real quick. I'm just curious what the choices are once you're ready to export, or do they make you do it? like some a certain way and you don't have any uh, choice. I think Francis uh, muted himself and he's talking. There you go. Oh, okay. I'm going to try starting the darn thing up and see what Caden Life does. All right. That's good to know. That's a good question. Um, Caden Life, right there, right? I'll start it right up. I hope I can get a project into it. Now I'll make a quick one. <laughs> it's not that hard to do. Okay. And file, open. One thing I do like is you can open a project. I don't think you can. You can do that without a lot of trouble from um, what happened to a demo videos. Okay, there's a project, right? Now let's, let's try exporting it. Let's go project, I think. Where did they put it? Let's see, I'm having a senior moment here. Feel clean, rend render, see? They call it render. render. Yeah. Yep. You got a lot of choices. See all those choices? I've always been, I've never tried any of them, <laughs> but you got a lot of choices. Uh, you have choices in formats, but I don't see uh, like bit rate or yeah, uh, maybe you're right. files per second. I mean, frames per second. You're right. Maybe they don't have it. I don't know. Video with yeah. alpha. While you're in KDE Live, can you rotate the video 90 degrees? Yeah, there's an it's an effect. Let's see if okay. I can figure that out. Thank you. It's um yeah, you can rotate videos. I I just saw it the other day. Let me. I don't see any choices other than maybe they, you don't have a choice. Huh. Maybe it's a, like a sub menu once you make a choice. No, yeah, that's just it. I'm going to export it as my favorite, which is MP4. If I can yeah. find the darn thing. It's down here somewhere. Lost this. Oh, there. H oh, there it is. H two three four two six four. Oh, there it is. Right click. I don't think it gives you too many choices. Nope. Mm. I, don't. I guess you're stuck with whatever you have. That takes the fun out of things, doesn't it? 
Interesting. And then the, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, then effects and uh, oh, met. Okay, let's let Sally Ann into the meeting. Um, effects. Let's see. Was it effects? Audio. Let's see if I can rotate. I don't. I remember seeing it in there somewhere. Darn it. Image adjustment. Can't be. I'm pretty sure you can do it inside um, the other one, ClipChamp, but I'm not sure I'm finding it in here, darn it. Gary, that's a good question for Google. Let me see if I rotate. Rotate and shear, maybe, I don't know. Oh, I gotta select a clip first. Then rotate and shear. Stop by padding. That's not it. Rotate. Stop by padding, padding. Rotate X. There's a good rotate. <laughs> you have to know what you're doing, though. With me, I'd end up with a real, real weird web video. See, rotate X, rotate Y, Z. I don't know what Z is. I, I don't remember what Z was from my math. Probably coming at you. That it rotates in ninety degrees increments. Well, you could. I'm not sure if I can find which one is ninety. Let's see. According should... to Google. Just type in ninety. Where? Are you? Under X. X? Let's try it. I think I just ruined something. <laughs> That's a 90 type. I'm not sure I can type in anything. I'm not seeing a place where I can type. I can rotate, but I can't see, see where the 90 and the 180 stuff is. I know I can do that in regular photos. I rotate keyframes. Click right on the number, 1261. Right here? Yeah, maybe that'll do it. Uh, nothing happened. No. Hmm. Well, maybe you can. I don't know. You got me. Yes, Presets. you can. Google says Pre so. I'm trusting Google here. But but your sample video looks nice, all tipped over. Yeah. Or... What the heck? You're <laughs> falling off the face of the earth. I have a question for Rob. Oh, stop, stop Do sharing, all then. the special features be notified when someone opens an email, et cetera, require that the other person also uses Gmail? In other words, if I send a Gmail to someone who has a Yahoo account, do I get a notification? As far as I know, yes, because it's really not a function of Gmail. Cool. So what, what's your what you're doing is you're setting a, a read receipt. Very good, thank you. I, that's another note for me. On that, but I'm pretty sure because it's a pretty common function throughout email clients. This is one of the best chats I have ever received. Had to jump off to go kill a spider crawling down my wall. Made me smile. Ray Baxter, you're on. Thanks, Judy, and then thank you, Francis. I always enjoy your your presentations. Long time uh, since I've seen you, uh, and this may not fall into video editing, but I'm going to ask the question any, anyway. Uh, my video editing is somewhat limited. Here's what I typically do: I will take a two-hour musical concert from a DVD and then make individual clips of just the song performance as MP4 files, which I then add to my Plex server. I have found that using the program Handbrake. I can automatically separate the chapters just based on what's on that DVD. Do you know of any other program that will do that? Uh, not really. I use Handbrake too. Yeah. And um, I, I recommend it to people that want to edit things. It uh, does a real good job and it's easy to learn. And it's free. Yeah, it's got the prices right. There's lots of people, people that would like to sell you a piece of software to do almost anything. The, the question is, when you're on 
the kind of income I've got, you, you can't really afford it. I used to afford it back when I was running a business and I, and working two jobs at, uh, during uh, during the, my daylight hours. <laughs> well, welcome to my world. Yep. Yeah, we we're both uh, retired with a short with a cash uh, flow uh, li limitation now. Uh, okay. Th thank you so much, Francis. Again, and really enjoyed your presentation. Right. Welcome. Uh, in, <clears throat> excuse me. In many circles, asking for a re read receipt is considered rude. I have I have I have my client set up so that I will never automatically respond to one. Okay, if you don't trust me to re read the stuff, that's 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 your problem. Uh, the only time I'll, I'll respond to one if there's a darn good reason, and I can't remember what decade I last had a reason uh, to to do that. And I think that's one of the advantages of these marketing programs because they will automatically, or you can, I don't want to say automatically, but you can get the analytics from them, um, basically whether it was received, whether it was opened, but that's really about as far as it goes. You know, all you're going to find out in most cases, did it get opened? And that's really what a read, it's not that someone's reading the email, they just opened it. Mm -hmm. With MailChimp, uh, I just got an email from a new president letting me know that the removed the former president, president. So that happened in the membership database. And then apparently he was still receiving things. Well, yes, he was on my MailChimp list. So I unsubscribed him from that, so to speak, and noticed that he opens every single MailChimp email and he's here today. And I'm thinking, okay, I want, obviously he must going to be relying on the group forwarding somebody, one of the officers forwarding the message out to all the members. So you know, but I could go back and look and see the history, which was, I thought, very valuable. Can't do that with a read receipt in Gmail. Like Rob said, one of the contact programs like MailChimp, and MailChimp is free for X number of uh, participants. Richard, you're on. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, Mr. Chow, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I think I'm going to be getting into video editing again. Uh, but my question is about is for Mr. Truman about the uh, uh, Gmail. I first created an account, an account in Gmail back in the 20th century when I found out that Gmail had a function of... Uh, free phone calls. And uh, uh, at the time I was uh, an old time land online. And so that was uh, very important to me. Now it's not so important, but I wanted, my question is, uh, is that free phone call still available in Gmail? Well, as I recall, it wasn't in Gmail, but Google does have uh, their app, it's their service called Voice, which is free calls, voice over IP. And I, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. Pretty sure it was in Gmail, but never. That, that's okay. It's such a long time ago anyway. I'll go look. Yeah. Google still does have this service. It's like, it's hard to find an actual number anymore, but they had a, a it's a free service and you can get to it by going to voice.google.com. Uh, and all you need is that account, you know, log in and you can, if you still have a Google voice number, it works. I can't even, they bought this service from someone. I can't remember who. My recommendation is that every uh, computer club have a Google Voice free number. There are still people out there 
who want to be able to pick up the phone and call and ask us questions about our groups. And again, the operative word is free. You can forward your own number to it. And it has a lot of good options, but again, um, a good thing to have for every computer club, just as another way people can get in touch. William, it's your turn. Uh, yes, I have a question for Rob. Um, you didn't go over, a, I, maybe I missed it, a email forwarding. Uh, I did have an email forwarding service with Google, and uh, it might have been the uh, upper level. Now they're charging for it. Uh, can you give me any ideas on uh, where to go for a, a free email forwarding service? Well, I mean, you can forward your emails in Gmail. Right. And you can set that up in, under settings. Yeah, well, this is for an email that's uh, from another domain, uh, a website that I didn't want to put personal uh, emails on it. So it's their president at domain name. And uh, okay. I was used. So that's what I'm trying to do. And then get that and then automatically forward it to the personal email. Oh. Again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, that's well, fine. I, I really enjoyed your I presentation. Domain email for a lot of that. Could I? Go I ahead. Two cents Maybe worth here. With uh, the Southwest Conference, um, Patricia and I did not want uh, to use GoDaddy's email program. So we set everything up with our Gmail accounts, so to speak that all of the GoDaddy emails were forwarded to our Gmail account we had made up for the conference. When we replied, it was as if it was coming from GoDaddy's email account. Is that what you're looking for? Something yes. like that? Yes. And I don't know if that's POP or IMAP because it was I shut the conference down in 2016 and all that is gone. But yes, you could do that with absolutely no problem at all. Okay, and thank you very background. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Drew King. Um, hello. Um, you can absolutely f um, forward um, emails. There is an inbound uh, rules section in Google Mail and you can and Gmail, and you can say any new messages that come in from such and such a person do this with it and you can file it into a label you can forward it to somebody and it will happen automatically every time they log in to they don't, they don't have to log into their mail it just happens automatically thank you very much yeah that was kind of my thought i mean by using the filter you could probably get this done i just don't do it that often i wasn't sure how far out on that limb i wanted to go Gary. Um, Judy, can I give a plug into the video program that I'm using? Absolutely. Um, it's not free, but it's worth every cent. It's called PTE AV Studio. I've been using it for many, many, many years. And it does everything you want to do. Fantastic form for help. You can talk to people, make suggestions to the, the uh, maker of the program, fantastic program, PTE AV Studio. Nothing better, because I've, I've tried dozens and dozens of different programs, free and paid and all that stuff. But if you're really looking for something very, very, very useful. Is it simple? It is quite intuitive, but there's also things that you learn and you say, oh my God, that's fantastic. I didn't realize you could do that, but you learn that through the forum. People ask questions and you and and you find out, oh, that's what I want to do. And that's the way you learn. Could you put the name of that program in the chat box for me? Uh, mine's disabled. Uh, oh, well, John will open Okay, it. I got it. 
Uh, Thank you. And I heard from the president of PC Bug in Naples, Florida, and Huey had given them a presentation. He's giving it to the Wednesday workshop. This, I think it's July, no, August 9th might be the Wednesday workshop, and he's giving it on SD cards, et cetera. And uh, he wanted to record it. He, he'd never done that before and upload it to their website. So he found a program called Lossless cut it's 1999 if you buy it from the microsoft store and it's free if you go to the website and he swears it is the easiest program known to man he would have been here today to talk about it but he's at his niece's wedding which i don't know why that took precedence and um but anyway that would be his two cents worth if he was here and again if you want to pay 20 bucks for it download it from the Microsoft Store. Other than that, go to the website and it is free. And he says he was clueless. And I looked at the video, came out wonderful. This is all about sharing information. Any other questions on either presentation? Oh, Francis, I have one. Let me find my doc here. How do the programs that you talked about today compare to the low-end paid programs like Adobe Premiere Elements? The low-end paid paid programs work fine, <laughs> except that uh, there's only well, I I made a presentation on Adobe Premiere Elements, and in six years only one group wanted it, so I decided it wasn't that the word free is pretty much what they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. So I, I I like it very much. I used it for years and years, and the price kept going up and up. And finally, I just gave up and started using uh, for a lot of the things I was doing um, the free analogs such as um, GIMP and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I gradually replaced all of the Adobe stuff as the price uh, rose each year. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with any of those. I, I know a lot of people like them. They also have more money than I've got. So it's all relative. And now they're renting them by paying yearly, I believe. And Bob G has a video editing program that he says he thinks is better than sliced bread. And so everybody has their own thing that is their favorite thing in the whole free world. And if it's free, it's got John Kennedy's name written all over it. Any other questions from anybody on either presentation? If not, Mr. Kennedy, would you please? Drew. Back, Drew. Drew. <laughs> Mute. Uh, one last little plug for in the free software market. Uh, YouTube is a good place to go to get training videos for these video editors. And what you'll find is that the open source free editors um, are more have more videos done about them because more people can review them, obviously, if you don't have to pay for them. So um, there is an, a product called OpenShot um, and another one called Shotcut that are both open source uh, .org, um, Vit completely free video editors that you can learn about on YouTube. And the DaVinci Resolve is probably the most video uh, created, edited um, thing on YouTube. You can learn beginner lessons, intermediate lessons, advanced lessons. Um, it's for somebody that's serious about doing video editing. It's not a, um, it takes up gigabytes of storage space on your computer wants lots and lots of memory and processor. So it's not something that you just throw on your computer for uh, trial and error, but it's something for, if you're gonna do some serious editing, um, it can directly upload your videos to YouTube for you if you want. So that's my, my plug for DaVinci. Thank you. And um, I just Googled the uh, program that Rob talked about GFC learning 
and they have, uh, it said 2,300 learning videos, and they have some on video editing and different programs. So you might want to take a look at that for ideas. Uh, and if you end up using one of uh, Francis's, let us know. We appreciate that, that, you know, somebody's gotten some concrete benefit how to and has started using something that has been demoed at a Wednesday workshop. And I will say very quickly, John, over to you. Hey, thank you all so much. Thank you, Rob, with all the Gmail stuff. And Francis, always good to hear about video editing, even for the little things of going through and just, oop, taking out that little wart, taking out that wart like we have to do sometimes. This ends our Wednesday workshops for July.